Coming up this week on Good God, we welcome Troy Dungan, former weatherman of Channel 8 News, WFAA. He'll be talking about his lifelong journey of faith as a Christian. Welcome to Good God. We're pleased to be joined today by Troy Dungan, someone that many of you might have known through three decades of his being the weatherman at Channel 8 WFAA. Troy, it's so good to have you. Nice to be with you, Pastor George. Thanks for asking me. Well, one of the reasons we're asking you, of course, is because so many people would have known you through the years, but they wouldn't have necessarily known uh, you in terms of your own faith journey, your mm -hmm. own personal uh, trust and faith in Jesus Christ as a Christian, mm -hmm. and how that has uh, played out in your own uh, personal life and also vocationally. So mm -hmm. we, we want to explore that together as well today. I, I want to point out that we have a book that you have written called mm -hmm. Jesus Makes Salsa by the Seashore. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll explore that uh, a little later, <laughs> a little more as well. But these okay. are some Bible studies that uh, you uh, conduct at WFAA, correct. Uh, but to begin with, let's just talk about uh, your your own personal spiritual life. Uh, in reading your book, I heard a little bit about your story as well, mm -hmm. and uh, learned that this is uh, not a late life conversion. This is a <laughs> lifelong uh, experience. And yes. Many of us grew up in the church like you. So how would you talk back about as it? I can remember? As, as a matter of fact, yes. I, right. I made a speech in Hillsboro last well two weeks ago, uh -huh. and that's where I grew up. And it was about this little book, and it was a, an author luncheon. Hey, I'm an author, look right, at right. And I got to talk about how I became a believer when I was about seven or eight years old. I think I was okay. probably nine when I walked down the aisle at the First Baptist Church of Hillsborough professing my faith. But yeah, I'd been a believer for some time, so sure. there was no Damascus Road experience there. Right. I mean, I was born into a Christian home. Everybody I knew, Christian people, pretty much all the people in Hillsboro, there were principally, possibly three or four Jewish families that went to church in another town on Saturday, as yes. far as we knew. Yes, right. And that was about it. So uh, I grew up in a Christian atmosphere, but I did I truly become a believer. And I didn't do much with that for a long time, as we'll explore later. Yes, yes. Well, I, I think it's interesting that those of us who grew up in Christian homes and in the church, uh, we uh, maybe have a model of conversion that is instantaneous because, as you say, of, of the Apostle Paul, who was converted in a flash on uh -huh. the road to Damascus. Uh, but many of us are, um, are really uh, hard pressed to find a time when we could talk about when we were lost so much as yes. when we were saved. Isn't that and, the truth? And, and maybe when, um, when, when we talk to parents who raise their kids in the church, we, we shouldn't. Um, uh, we shouldn't make them think that somehow their own kids' experience is less because they have been uh, sort of reared in the faith uh -huh. and they, they, they maybe awaken to it more than are struck by it. Something like well, that? For, for instance, in my case, some years ago, our former pastor, Hal Habecker, and I were called over to this project called I Am Second. Yes. I'm right. sure you've heard of that. Sure. And so they were going to have us tell our stories. Well. Hal told his, and they used his because he's a pastor, but so I sat down there for 30 minutes or so and chatted with these people and told them my story. And, and when we finished, they didn't exactly use these words, but they said kind of like, boring. Yes, you're, you're not right, a recovering right. addict. You haven't just gotten out of prison. You became a believer in your little kid. Right. Thanks for coming in. Yes, really appreciate that. Yes. Oh my so, goodness. So you know, boring is good. Boring, boring can be good. <laughs> we, we, uh, but the the whole of the Christian life is also a thrilling thing. Well, absolutely, this. See, that's that's the part that doesn't come out in such an interview. Yes. Because it's the opportunities that you have, and sometimes it takes a while to take advantage of those. Again, right. we'll talk about later. But yeah, boring in that sense is good, but thrilling it also is. Very good. Well, uh, so. Uh, Troy, I think that uh, many people would want me to take some time at least to talk about your uh, career as, as, as a weatherman. And I, I, th I want to re recall to you a, a, a personal story uh, that Dave Lane and I had this conversation oh years my. ago. Now Dave uh, was, is the late uh, general manager of Channel 8. Uh, WFAA, and uh, he was a member of our church and a I dear friend. I remember he was, yes. And uh, so I, I remember quartering him one day and saying to him, okay, Dave, you've got to explain to me, why do we need so much of the evening news dedicated to weather? Now, I'm a city kid, uh -huh. and so 
I just think, you know, you get up and whatever the weather is, it is, and that's all there is to it. And, you know, if you could just tell me somebody, it's going to be nice or it's going to be raining, that's good enough mm -hmm. for me, right? But Dave, you've got Doppler radar, you've got all this stuff. And he looked at me and he said, Troy Duncan. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute, what does that mean, Dave? He says, the most trusted man on Channel 8, year in and year out, is Troy Dungan. Well, I'm pleased that Dave said that. Dave was a really good guy who left us much too soon. Well, but did. yeah, that, that's one thing. The, we had this billboard for years, had my picture on it, and it simply said, trust Troy. Well, That was a brilliant marketing concept, but <laughs> it gives the responsibility for you not to do anything bad. <laughs> <laughs> because once you violate that trust, then you're done. Right. But fortunately, I didn't do anything that bad, and I, and I, you know, I still have some shelf life in that. People still remember that. Interesting. And that kind of gives me a, an added platform when I do Christian-oriented speeches. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, you and I probably have just a little bit in common in that, because you're a weatherman and I'm a preacher. People think we actually have a little more control over this than we. I, I often tell people, no, I'm I'm in sales, not management. Well, so, exactly, you know, exactly. Right. And you know, we're all selling something, aren't right, we? Right. And you're selling Jesus, That's which is right. a really good product. Right. Right. And I was selling trust in what I'm talking about. Yes. Which is uh, it goes hand in hand. Yes. Now, Troy, when people watch TV, uh, there, are, there are a lot of people who report the weather, and mm -hmm. then there are meteorologists. Mm -hmm. uh, help us make a distinction there between those who just sort of tell us what uh, the, the ticker says mm -hmm. and, and those who, who make judgments about it. Well, in the old days, there were a lot of just weather reporters, yes. but that changed over the years. Now, I'm kind of a hybrid. Uh -huh. My degree is not in meteorology. It's right. a Baylor degree in political science and in communications. Mm -hmm. But uh, I had the advantage of having private lessons uh -huh. in meteorology. Okay. When I got a job in Houston, they said, okay, we know you don't have this degree, we will train you. Wow. So a couple of professors at the University of St. Thomas uh -huh. came over and, and worked with me every afternoon for about a year and a half and developed a degree plan based on what they taught me. Wow. That's unusual. I'm the only person I know with that background. Wow. These days, almost everybody you see on television doing weather has a degree in meteorology or atmospheric sciences. Mm -hmm. For a long time, some of those folks were military meteorologists. Mm -hmm. That's not so much the case anymore. Now people study meteorology at the university and go into it from there. But you don't really see anybody anymore that's just a weather reporter. Yes. Now the reason for that is people at home are much more sophisticated oh, now. In the old days, you drew some stuff on a wall and you talked mm -hmm. about it, mm -hmm. and the people at home, that's all they had. Now, if I want to know what the radar looks like, I just get it on my phone. Yes. Satellite pictures, people are more educated as far as meteorology is concerned as laypersons, so you have to have somebody that knows what sure, he or sure, she sure. is talking about. Right. You know, there is um, lots of weather-related stories in the Bible. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, that there, there are these stories of Jesus calming the sea and, uh, and, and, and of Jonah, of course. Mm -hmm. One of those stories is, is in your book. Uh, and, and so it's, it's interesting probably that uh, <clears throat> we, we have the, a, a larger metaphor about weather and about the unpredictability of life mm -hmm. and, and, and how faith comes into that where we can't actually control uh, external events mm -hmm. and all of that, but we can control something about how we respond to them. Uh, talk about how faith plays a role for you in the unpredictability of life and, and what you've learned about that. Well, certainly, as you say, the weather, we have become much more sophisticated in, in forecasting weather, but it's not going to happen the same way every time. Right. So you have to have faith that you're going to do the best you can, yes. but you can't beat yourself up if you would fail. And that's also the way it is in life. Yes. Okay, you failed. You sin. Right. You miss an opportunity to witness. Right. You don't beat yourself up for that. Right. You say, you know what? I'm not going to do that. Next time you get up and you do better the next time. Right. It's the same way in, in business and in faith. You just do what you can, do what you know is right, and when you mess up, which you inevitably will, get up and get going again. Wonderful, wonderful. I'm not sure if that's the answer to the question, but that's how I, that's what I interpreted. Well, I'm not sure that <laughs> I'm not sure there's a, a right answer to it, so much as a, an awareness mm -hmm. that um, there's there's an I interaction between uh, faith and life 
that um, sometimes I think we oversell how much faith will create the conditions under which we will prosper, say, for instance, mm. or uh, we'll be victorious over uh, the uh, different um, random things of life that might happen to us, but we all suffer and we all struggle and unpredictable things happen to us. Uh, but having that stability that is able to say, everything is not always okay, but mm -hmm. I can be okay in it. Oh, uh, absolutely, because, because success can be defined in many different ways. It, success is not victory in everything in life. Success in a faith sense is overcoming that, being the circumstances don't control your life. Right. Your faith in God does, he's got it. Right. Right. No surprises. He knows what he's doing, even right. if we don't. That's right. So you just have to go with uh, whatever God wants to do. It reminds me of Jesus on the boat when the disciples were afraid and he stood up and looked at them and said, Oh, ye of little faith, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, it, we, we had to come to realize uh, that uh, there, there is a Lord of wind and wave uh, mm -hmm. and that uh, we, we don't need to fear. Uh, it strikes me that the, that someone has counted 365 times in the Bible is some version of fear not or do not be afraid. Hmm. As if once a day, every year, mm -hmm. we could hear that if we went to the Bible to hear it. Mm -hmm. Apparently we need to know that. Oh yeah, I was, one of my little things I was reading this morning, I was in Exodus and where, where Moses goes back to God and says, well, Pharaoh said not only is he not gonna let us go, he's not gonna give a straw for the brick. <laughs> and right. God pretty much in Troy's translation says, Moses, I got this. I got this. You know, Very I, good. it's not gonna happen the way you want it, but I got this. Right, right. Well, Troy, you, you've told me that, um, and, and you report this in the book as well, that uh, uh, it, it took you a while uh, to move from a really private faith, a really mm -hmm. personal sense of this is who I am and I go to church and I do that, to, to, to seeing a, a larger stewardship of your faith. Mm -hmm. What was the motivation? Was there a moment for you? Was there a, a new conversion mm -hmm. point? It wasn't, it wasn't a moment, but it was three moments. Okay. I, uh, through a, uh, a friend, I met a guy named Dr. Larry Poland. Dr. Yes. Perry Poland was the founder of a thing called Master Media, uh -huh. which is a ministry to the movers and shakers in show business. Right. Not so much actors, only a few actors have very much influence, but mostly producers, studio executives, and so forth. Well, chance meeting, of course. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was introduced by a mutual friend, and I heard him speak. And then two more times in the next two months, here's this guy from Redlands, California, that was in Dallas. We met two more times, and what I took away from that was in each of those cases, he told me and our group that was assembled that in most of the studios in Hollywood and the area there and the TV stations as well, there were weekly Bible studies. Yes. And I thought, you know, maybe I'm supposed to be doing something with this right. 62 years after I became a believer. Right. And uh, so I go into the office and ask our operations manager if I can have the conference room. 30 minutes every Wednesday at one o'clock for a Bible study, and he said, I guess. Uh -huh. And then he asked his boss, and he asked his boss, and finally went way up to the CEO, and, and they said, uh, it's okay as long as he doesn't coerce people to come, right. and if he needs the room for something else, to go somewhere else. Right. So that was, that was it. I was, I was motivated to do a Bible study, to teach a Bible study, and then the next problem was, but I've never done this before. I don't yes. know how to do this. Right, right. But I found, and I'll, I'll bet you have a similar experience. When you sit down at your desk to prepare your sermon, you have your materials there and you say, Holy Spirit, help me with this. You know, and help you know me what? Jesus. And he does. He does. Isn't yeah. that neat? I yes. would sit down and out would come Bible studies. It was yes. amazing. That's terrific. <laughs> well, I think it's actually a, a beautiful thing to think about how in our faith tradition of Christianity, uh, generally speaking, we don't just leave it up to the professionals. Uh, that, that we do depend upon uh, people who feel called to ministry to help guide the congregation and lay people. But there is this notion that God empowers all of us uh, mm -hmm. to study and to pray and to read and to understand and share. And so let's explore that a little more as we talk about your book right after the break. Okay. Okay. The Thanksgiving Foundation operates Thanksgiving Square. Good God salutes the Thanksgiving Foundation for advocating interfaith dialogue to promote understanding, harmony, and friendship in a community of diverse faith traditions and cultures. 
sure you have now published the book. I have. Jesus Makes Salsa by the Seashore uh, and Other Fresh Approach Bible Studies. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, uh, the title itself is catchy, right? It well, has, it is. It, it's, uh, uh, most of these stories have a humorous hook. Right. But as you said, you've read at least some of them, so you know they're serious Bible studies. They are. But I think if God doesn't have a sense of humor, I'm in a lot of trouble. Right. That's why the cover shows a smiling ichthus. I thought, I thought Jesus would like that. So the ichthus <laughs> is uh, the symbol of the fish, uh -huh. and uh, it, <laughs> it is a smiling fish. There That's it right. is. Uh, because the early church, uh, that was uh, uh, an acronym for Christ, sure. uh, and, and, and also uh, so much with uh, the early uh, disciples, they were fishermen. Uh, and so this, this first uh, uh, Bible study in the book uh -huh. talks about Jesus making breakfast on the seashore. That's sea right, shore. and the ichthus plays a part in that as well, because right. of course, just everybody knows this story, breakfast by the sea. Yes. But uh, Jesus was making a fire on the beach, and it said he was cooking uh, fish and bread. And he told the guys to bring over some of that fish, that ichthus that you just caught, so the question was, if he's already cooking fish, why did he tell him to bring over fish? It had to do with the two Greek words, ichthus, which means fish, and apsarion, which can mean fish, but contextually can mean a, a sauce or a condiment. So in this case, I, my interpretation was, and, and some other Bible scholars, I'm not a Bible scholar, said, yeah, that's, that's right, it, it was a sauce. It was a salsa. Mm -hmm. So he was putting this salsa, his apsarion, and that ichthus fish, for these guys, and uh, and of course he was also making bread, and it was it was going to be unleavened bread, folded over. So that morning Jesus invented fish tacos. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, there's no two ways the, about this. There it is. Well, <laughs> especially if you're a Texan, exactly. it is what it is, right? Well, actually, I think it's a it's a beautiful thing to realize that um, you have. Um, poached into our territory, Troy, uh, using uh, Greek words to distinguish uh, meaning and all of that, but good on you for doing that. And Thank we're, you. we're proud of you for being able to recognize those distinctions. I've studied under a couple of really good Bible teachers and, and know enough about Greek and Hebrew to be dangerous. Yes, well, actually, <laughs> here's the dirty little secret. That's true of us preachers, too. <laughs> and sometimes we make more of it than probably we should. Uh, but, uh, but, but it's actually a, a, a beautiful thing to learn uh, other languages and words. And I know that you are also uh, a traveler. Yes. Uh, you, you like to go, uh, you and your wife, to different places. And, uh, and isn't it true that when we travel, uh, we uh, experience something about life uh, from other people's eyes in their languages, mm -hmm. in their customs, in their, uh, in, in their food and drink, that, sure. that, it, it, that changes us, that, that helps us see some fuller picture outside of our routines. Yeah, you have to, uh, you gain more understanding of people, right. different lifestyles. We, you know, one of our favorite places, we've been a couple of times, is Istanbul. Now that's, uh -huh. that's about as exotic as you can get. Yes. And of course, although Turkey is a Muslim country, the government is secular to a large yes. degree, but, all the people you deal with basically are Muslim. And you discover that not everybody's a bad guy. Right. You know, it's the same way with us. There are good Christians and bad Christians. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's, it's very enlightening and broadening to travel right. in a place like that. But also in other places, uh, Italy, one of our favorite places. Oh yes, me too. Italy is kind of a dark place spiritually, but yes. when you're there, you just try to be light. Yes. It's a beautiful place, but spiritually, yes. It's kind of like if you see people in church, they're older people yes. that remember World War II. Yeah, and those right. people are pretty well gone. Right. But the younger generation, how shall I say this? We have a young friend who uh, works with Campus Crusade at the university in Florence, which uh -huh. is at least 40,000 students, many right. foreign. And when she was first there the first year, she and her team took a survey. And out of 100 kids that they interviewed, not one of them interviewed Jesus as God, as deity. Wow. So it's a hard job. Yes. But, uh, it's, it's good to encourage people like that. And as I say, to be light when you're there, mm -hmm. to, uh, to model Jesus as best we can. Well, back to your book, I think um, part of what happens when we read the Bible, and I don't know that most people realize that this is what we're doing, but we're actually traveling. We're oh, yeah. traveling into another culture in another time, and we're experiencing uh, who we are through the eyes of other people, and we're identifying with them, just as if you travel to Italy or Istanbul or someplace like that. And, and, and in this case, we are 
actually able to enter into the ex fresh experience of people who walked with Jesus and uh -huh. who uh, were with Moses and, and who traveled these spiritual journeys. So we're invited to be changed by their experience too. And you do that with these Bible studies. Well, thank you. I, and and uh, in regard to that, in reading the Bible, I heard a Bible teacher in California a few years ago say, don't read the Bible like you're speeding through it. Yes. Consider it like when you're panning for gold in a stream and you look and uh, you look and you find a nugget yes. and you dwell on that. You don't just read until you understand and, and experience what's going on. Right. So you can speed read anything, but right. is, read the Bible in a year, that's great, but what's the hurry? <laughs> there you go, there you go. It's, it, it's better to meditate on a few words mm -hmm. and understand them than mm -hmm. it is to rush through and read a lot of words without understanding. Right? And people think meditate, what does that mean? Well, yeah. I've heard it said, if you know how to worry, you know how to meditate. It's a different concept, <laughs> but what do you do when you worry? You go over something over and over yes. and over in your mind. Nice. Now, if you're concerned about it and worry is the other thing. When you meditate, it's a positive thing. You find a nugget and you yes. go over and over and over it in your mind and see, look at it from all different sides. And, and when you're doing that, you're actually doing the opposite of worrying, aren't you? No, exactly. You're kind of letting God have it, mm -hmm. and then you can rest in a different place. Exactly. Well, w one of the things I, I was thinking as I was reading through some of your Bible studies is uh, the, um, the, the willingness to address these things and even to be playful uh, with the text and to imagine it might have been like this or it might be like that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in our modern Christian world, uh, I think we are too worried about being wrong. We, we, we feel like we have to get it right every mm -hmm. time. Uh, but a more Jewish understanding of how to read the Bible is to, to wrestle with it and to turn it in many mm -hmm. different ways mm -hmm. and, and to say, you know, they have a phrase, this is Torah too. You know, that is, uh, <laughs> yes. you know, this is another angle on that. And the rabbis would, and the question is not so much who is right, but have we considered all these possibilities? Mm -hmm. And, and I, I hear that in your Bible studies, that you're willing to do that and, and, and risk some uh, what ifs about, about that for us. Sure, I think, you know, we're not gonna be 100% right about everything, but the concept is there yeah. in all these stories. And I think, uh, I, the, my spiritual gift, let me, how shall I say this? I do speaking on behalf of this book. I yes. did that in Hillsborough a couple of weeks ago. And I, when I do this, it's either to a church group or somewhere that I have the okay to be Christian in my speech. Right. And so most of the people in the audience are generally Christians. And I'm yes. thinking, am I preaching to the choir here? Right. But no, I, I was able to link it with my spiritual gift, which is encouragement slash exhortation. Uh -huh. So that's what you frequently do, because yes. most of your audience members are gonna be believers. Right but you exhort them and encourage them mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. step up and do what you're supposed to be doing. Right, right. And I find when I finish doing this speech, people come and say, you know, I needed that. Right. And I'm not trying to be bossy, but hey, you're supposed to be doing something. It took me 62 years to figure that out, but yes. you're supposed to be doing something. So there's a delightful place uh, in, in the book where you talk about um, the Bible study that you led. And, and I think how you came to a pattern of prayer together. Mm -hmm where you discovered that there was something to the praying together yes. uh, that was even more important, uh, not so much for its effectiveness maybe, but for how it changed you all uh, in the participation. Say something about uh, what's the difference between just simply asking Troy to pray for you and praying together uh, with the group. Exactly, we would go around the room and the, the lesson was about 10 minutes, then we'd take 15 minutes or so mm -hmm. and prayer requests. And as the people got to trust each other more, they'd lay things on the table that were quite personal because mm -hmm. they knew they weren't gonna leave that room. And then I would say, always say, I'm going to voice these prayers. Yes. But you know, God doesn't need call waiting. He can listen to everybody. Mm -hmm. You be praying too, right. because the group is going to be effective and it also will be, uh, advantageous to the people that are praying to know that people are in this with them. Yes. Uh, fellow you probably know, Dr. Ron Allen, who's a professor mm -hmm. at Dallas Seminary, yes, Hebrew right. professor. Years ago, his, one of his daughters had a very, very serious situation and the surgery was either going to be a success or one small slip and she could die right there on the mm -hmm. operating table. The surgeon was a Christian surgeon. He gathered the family and he gathered all the operating room staff around and he said, okay, we're all gonna pray about this. Surgery was a success, but later he told Dr. Allen, he says, 
you know, we didn't all have to do this. I could have prayed for this, or you could have prayed for this, but because we all did this, we all shared the blessing. Lovely. Isn't that cool? It, it is really a beautiful <laughs> thing. And then when, when, we're, when we experience the answer to a prayer, uh, which I think most of the time is healing or strength or peace or some such mm -hmm. thing through all of these processes, uh, the, it, it's funny, isn't it, how when we, when we actually begin to pray, we want an exceptional intervention into ordinary life. And then when we fin get the answer we want, we're just so grateful for the, the, the medical treatment and the surgery uh, that, that took place and those sorts of things. It's really not an either or though, is it? Mm -hmm. it's, it's how God works uh, to put all these things together expertise and medical knowledge and, and medicine itself and our prayers and our hearts, uh, compassion, and it, it, it all works together somehow in this great uh, alchemy of, uh, of God's work in, in the spirit. Absolutely, I agree. Yeah, so uh, when you look back on these years of this Bible study, uh, is there a story or two that, uh, that, that you would want to share about uh, how it changed someone's life or yours? Well, it, it changed my life because, as you know, as a preacher, teacher, often you get more out of a lesson than the people that you're teaching. Exactly. Because we're always learning. Right. But uh, I was struck of the fact that, that every week, the people that were supposed to be there would be there. Ah. Now, we had the conference room for 30 minutes. Sometimes there'd be 12 people. That'd be about the average. Sometimes there would be three people and me. Mm -hmm. And those were the three people who were supposed to be there that day. Right. Dr. Larry Poland visited once. We had a room full. We had 25, 30 people. And that was a wonderful experience, too. But one of the examples that I have is one, I, didn't, I never knew what I was going to teach. You sit down at the desk, and uh, the Holy Spirit said, teach that passage about being unequally yoked. Mm -hmm. I said, what is that all about? So, mm -hmm. all right, I did it. And, and after the little study was over, there were about 10, 12 people there. Three of them came up to me and said, that was for me. Wow. So I stopped asking the Holy Spirit why. Yes. I said, you want me to teach this? I guess you got something in mind. Yes, very good. <laughs> and then well, once we had a, a young lady whose his dog, Idgy the dog, had cancer. We prayed for Idgy the dog. I mean, mm -hmm. and the dog eventually died, but she had peace. Mm -hmm, the young lady mm -hmm. had peace. We're still friends, still Wonderful. dear friends. Well, I think you're much more generous with um, your... Um, uh, saying that maybe it was only three people that needed to be there that day than I am when I look out in <laughs> the congregation. I think actually there are a lot more of you that are supposed to be here that actually are here this week. Uh, but, uh, but, but then that's not our responsibility, is that's it? That's true. When I saw Jack Jones perform here one time, the, the Love Boat song, yes, right. and it was a really cold band night, and he said, I hate it when the band leader says, Boy, there are more people on stage than there are in the audience. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> it's exactly. like my wife says, she has the gift of discouragement. That's what <laughs> that's that is. The gift of discouragement, that's that, great. That, that came in when I, was, I taught these Bible studies and always threatened to write this book. Right. And Janet says she has that gift. She said, why would anybody want to read that? Yeah, that's great. That's great. <laughs> Same thing as when I go and make a speech. She went with me to Hillsborough, but she usually doesn't because you know what wives are like. She says, I've heard everything you have to say, and frankly, you're not that funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, I hadn't heard everything you had to say, and I think you are. So uh, it's well, wives, been a delight. Wives are here to keep us humble. That's exactly right. Well, Troy, thank you so much for joining us on Good God. This has been a delightful time of conversation. My extreme pleasure. Thank you, George. Thank you for your Christian witness and for uh, the book, and we continue to pray for you as you uh, continue to do the Lord's work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you God so bless much. you. Okay. The Thanksgiving Foundation operates Thanksgiving Square. Good God salutes the Thanksgiving Foundation for advocating interfaith dialogue to promote understanding, harmony, and friendship in a community of diverse faith traditions and cultures. 